Okay, so this is uh, volume 11. Happy to be here with all of you. And then, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why I chose this topic that I did, which many of you probably already know, and some of you are probably still wondering. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, personally, I love food, and I think it's the, the connection between any culture. If you ever think about the two words that go together, it's always the culture and then that type of food. Um, and so I thought of this as something to explore. And while you're passing around, if you'll do a quick exercise with me, if you can all just close your eyes and imagine back to simpler times when you were a child growing up in your parents' house and it's a Saturday morning and they're preparing breakfast and you smell those smells. And there's always one smell that's the most common. Uh, for me, that was za'atan. And you can open your eyes now. <laughs> so that's why I chose this topic. And as people, <laughs> people have heard... Zata, you always hear about it. It's a super food. It's got all these things. It makes you smarter. Eat it before your exam so you can do well. <laughs> I've heard this. I've heard this all my life. And I, I was like, you know, is this really true? Is it? it yeah. So, so you know, I, I, I wanted to believe my mom, but I'm a man of science. So I thought, I'm going to research this and find out for myself. And then to, to really find out about any food, it's always connected with different aspects of culture, with history, with, cult, with different parts of society. And so that's the overlap that I was interested to explore. So in order to find out my question, does Zatha make you smarter, I had to kind of go back and do a little bit of digging. Uh, so a quick outline. I'm going to do kind of a quick uh, Zatha 101, talk a little bit of the background, how to eat it. Uh, I saw a lot of your name tags, so most of you probably already know how to eat it, but I'll just explain <laughs> more. Uh, cultural significance, history, uh, medicinal usage, its reputation as a brain food, and then even looking into the, the future of Zatha. And so where this all started for me was the Arabic breakfast. Most experts say breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And I think those experts were probably Arab. Uh, and if you look at the quote here, breakfast is, is so important because it's a place for people to gather where just as important the food is the time that people spend together and the experience and the stories that they share. And it's kind of remnants of a simpler time where you had time to slow down and sit down and share a meal together. And every food that's uh, in an Arabic breakfast is meant to be shared you know, you're, and I think that represents what it's really about. And at the center of each breakfast was always Zatha. And so that's what I wanted to focus on. So here's a quick intro to Zatha. And now I will, to get something out of the way, there's a million different ways to spell Zatha. <laughs> I just so happen to choose the best way. So this is what we're going to use. Uh, and so a lot of the spelling is because Zatha is spread out through so, throughout the region and so different places that speak kind of different dialects, different countries. It's changed, of course, a million times, so there's no one right way. And as you'll see, uh, as I dig into some other aspects, there's a million different ways to do it. No one is the best, even though you might think so, but I'm just going to show you how it differs. There's other names of Zafa. The, the oldest name is Hyssop, and that goes way, way, way back. Uh, other names you'll see here, there's Syrian oregano, wild marjoram, European oregano, oregano, pot marjoram, wild marjoram, winter marjoram, and win my, my personal favorite, winter sweet. <laughs> Uh, and so you'll see there's a, like, a lot of differences. It's hard to get anyone to agree on Zatha, and I'll discuss why this is later. Yeah, so we're going to talk about you know, exactly what is Zatha. I think a lot of us grew up eating it, but you still were never really sure what it is. Uh, and so simply, quite simply, it's time. Uh, uh, and what that means, so time comes from the Greek word tomas for courage. And a lot of, uh, in medieval times, knights would have badges with time, uh, to, uh, basically to wear, showing that they're courageous or brave. Uh, so, I mean, you saw the, the focus around time, it's time, it's time. Uh, it's simple, right? That's what Zatha is. It's time. Uh, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Uh, so Zatha is an herb, but it's not just one herb. It could be, you know, a couple different herbs in the hyssop family. I actually, scratch that. It's a combination and a mix of herbs. Even that's not true. Sometimes they're sesame seeds. Uh, and then actually it's not even that because it's a paste with some types of seeds, herbs, sesame seeds, and of course lots of olive oil. Uh, and still not even that simple. Uh, there's 22 different herb species that are referred to as often in the region. They all differ in different ways, but what they have in common is essential oils. Uh, and then I think the, the, the last sentence here that the Jihad Noon says, personally I can eat Zatha any time, it's what opens your palates. And I think I would agree with that. Uh, so here's the core four, kind of the underlying base that makes up almost any Zatha recipe, no matter where, even though they change a bunch. There's thyme, oregano, sesame seeds, and sumac. Uh, thyme and oregano are two of few herbs that are actually taste better, more flavorful when they're dry than they are when they're fresh. Uh, and then now I know what most of you probably are thinking, and that's, what the heck is sumac? 
Uh, and it's a question I asked for a long time. So, <laughs> you went, uh, yeah, you're probably wondering. So it's, it's a shrub or a bush that can grow from three feet to up to 32 feet tall. Uh, yeah, that is, becomes a tree at that point, <laughs> I found out. And then so these red berries are ground up, and then they're used in a lot of, you know, in the region of Malaysia, food for meats, salads. It gives that kind of tang, almost lemony flavor. Uh, and if you have za'atar and you taste that kind of tang, that's, that's the sumac coming through. Uh, and so regional variation. So like I said, you know, we, we, there's a million different mixes. Everyone has, it's kind of a, a source of personal pride from the household to the country. And everyone's got a secret recipe that they think is best. Uh, throughout, from country to country, there are some kind of constants, uh, that, but everything changes. So even what I say here might not necessarily be what you've heard. Uh, because it does change. But just some general rules of thumb in Jordan, kind of Palestinian Jordanian Zatar, which is usually pretty similar. Uh, it's particularly heavy on the sumat, which is the way I like it. Uh, and so it looks a little bit darker, a little more red. And Jordan is actually the largest exporter of Zatar in the world. So, uh, next is Lebanese Zatar, which usually is a little greener. It kind of focuses on time, and sometimes they get a little fancy and put dried orange zest in it, as the <laughs> Lebanese are known to do. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's also Syrian za'atar, which you may have heard is also called as za'atar halabi. And this has a million different variants. So as you can see this list here, pepper, cumin, ground walnut, toasted chickpeas. And it's just really a big mix, uh, different seeds that people mix in. So you could have endless uh, different kinds of za'atar. So don't worry. You can always try a new one. And then now, so I'm going to explore a little. And we saw a little bit of it in the video about how is za'atar made. Uh, and so the general process is it's harvested during the summer months, and that just means picked or cut off the, the plant, and it's kept on the root and then washed and kind of get some of the dirt and the purities off. The next step is then it's left to dry outdoors. And it, what's very important is that it's kept in the shade, so it's not dried in the sun. The sun dries it out and can even burn some of the leaves, which will give it a bad taste. Uh, and that's left in, to dry for about two weeks. Next is when the leaves are hand-picked, uh, laborers usually do this either by hand or with basic tools, and I can tell you that this takes a long time. Uh, but it's good for meditation if you want to practice. <laughs> uh, and then after that is sifting, kind of continuing the process, cleaning out the leaves, so you're left with only the pure za'atar. And then last but not least, it's ground uh, into the consistency that you see in front of you and mixed with whatever of the million different possible things it could be mixed with, as you just saw. And then here's a quick infographic. It's picked, it's ground. It's sifted, it's roasting sesame seeds, and then that's the final mix. Okay, and now so much, what you're wondering, many of you probably ate it a million times, but if you haven't, uh, you will find out how you eat it. So there's a nice quote here from a restaurant owner in Nazareth. She adds it to almost everything, meat, fish, marinade, salads. Uh, the most simple way is just bread with olive oil and za'atar. It's a whole meal. It's a very humble meal. And, you know, it's the best way to eat it, I think. Uh, personally, I think there's no wrong way to eat za'atar. You can put it on anything. I know people eat it on watermelon. Uh, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> Mint and cheese. Yeah, try it. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, there's nothing that cannot be improved with Zalta. So, uh, uh, the only thing that you do want, usually, olive oil. The two go together beautifully. So if you have Zalta, you should probably have olive oil nearby. And then here's some pictures of different ways you can eat Zalta. Uh, as you can see, there's a manusha there on the top left. There's like the hummus way here. There's avocado and eggs, butternut squash. <laughs> Uh, and then some more Instagram ones, you see there's the egg and the avocado toast. <laughs> As you can see, uh, Zothar is very modern and trying to keep up and hip with the times. And then the bottom right there, you see the, most, the simplest way and the purest way and just dipping oil into the Zothar and eating it. Uh, and then, so I can't talk about Zothar without at least mentioning Lebna. Uh, it's what I call the Arabic PB&J. And Lebna is a, is a hand-strained yogurt. It's a little tartar and thicker in consistency than the common yogurt that uh, other people are used to. But the two go together perfectly, and uh, it's really a match made in heaven. <laughs> I hope you guys had dinner before this. <laughs> and then, so, of course, I think one of the most symbolic uh, items that you use out there is the manusha that's, you know, the, the famous uh, started in Lebanon and spread throughout the region, and then now it's pretty popular in the U.S. And then, so how that's prepared... It's commonly through the sides, which is a hot clay pot, and this roots back to 5,000 years ago from Phoenician heritage. Uh, it's still, I think, the, most, the way that's prepared that really ties the roots to the beginning. And then when you use the sides, you have to use a special tool to make sure that the bread's the right thinness and consistency. And you might have seen it, if you've seen it prepared on a sides before, it's called a bread pillow. Uh, it's not this one, uh, <laughs> and it's not any of these, <laughs> but it is this one. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so it's used to let the dough rise on the pillow and so that it has the, cons the thinness and then can be transferred directly to the sage. So I don't know if any of you are good pizza makers, but if you try to transfer a dough that thin and that large on your hand, it's probably going to tear. So that's what the pillow is important for. Uh, another common way of preparation, of course, is the brick oven, and that has that nice smoky, crispy flavor uh, that's also very delicious and also very nice to see. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how Zatra became to be uh, a cultural icon and to be representative of what it means to be Arab and, and nationalism and things like that. And so this is a beautiful quote by Ali Yunus, uh, who's a famous writer. So she also defines Zatra in the same ways we just saw, that it's an herb, uh, it grows wildly in the Middle East, it's a mixture, sesame, other spices, uh, but then the, the focus that it's a blend made by mixing nostalgia and necessity. Uh, eaten as a dip with olive oil, za'atar is ubiquitous staple on breakfast tables in Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Palestine. And in this quote, we had nothing to eat but za'atar and olive oil is an expression meaning we had only our staples. So it shows you kind of focusing on the important things and had the humble roots of za'atar. And that really all that matters is that you're around the people you love and sharing a meal together. Uh, and then it's also even spilled over uh, into music. And so it flowed with symbolism and identity. And uh, there's the famous Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish and the composer Marcel Khalif came uh, together, or he used the lyrics um, for a collaboration called Ahmed al Arabi. This was after Marcel Khalif studied classical music in Russia, and he made this beautiful song. If you go home, I would listen to it on Spotify. It's very, the whole album is fantastic. And I'll show you uh, just uh, quick lyrics from that song. Uh, to those hands of Zatar and darkened stone, I voice this cry. To Ahmed, forgotten and alone. The passing clouds have left me, homeless and unknown and only mountains dare to hide me in a barren home. So you can see the connection, and Zathar is kind of you know, the root. Because it grows wild, it has become that, that connection to the land and to the, the roots that you come from. Uh, and just like anything else that has any Palestinian origins, it has become entangled uh, in the debate and politics. Uh, and so this is because Zathar became placed on the protected plant list, which means that people couldn't pick wild Zathar. For Palestinian people who grew up on the land, Picking, off, picking off that either to eat it or to sell it, their livelihood, uh, that became another way, another loss of any kind of ownership on their own land. Uh, and so this became a big issue. Uh, and this is a quote here, and he talks about that to really understand it, that you know, what Zathar is, it's not just a plant. It's going to nature and the harvest. And during the commercialization process, which is why this protected plant list came to play, uh, the connection between man and his land was broken. So it's impossible to understand this injustice without the cultural context. So meaning the significance of Zathar and harvesting have in Palestinian culture and in shaping Palestinian identity. So Zathar continues, in, 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 just like other foods like olives and olive oil, uh, represents the people. Uh, and then another quote here representing the connection to Palestine specifically uh, is connected from the land and, and to eat Zathar and Zathar and the spice mixture is to partake in our land. And because it comes from the land, I think you know, any, any kind of plant that comes directly from the soil, people always have a special connection to it. And then so I touched on a little bit Zathar as a means of life. A lot of people uh, you know, live on Zathar and not just eating it. Uh, and the UN recognized this in, in their efforts to improve the economy in, in Lebanon after a couple different wars in the south of Lebanon. So they knew it was a feasible crop, especially because it went with sumac, which are two good crops for the region. And this is this line I really like, that Zathar is resilient, uh, much like the people who grow up on the same land. And so the video we saw earlier was one of the recipients of that program, Abu Qasim, and he talks here about how powerful the programs are. So you know, harnessing the energy of Zatar that usually just grown wild uh, can really change a lot of things. So he, just one kilo of seeds produces 5.5 million plants, uh, and, it, and it talks about how, how well it smells, and then that basically through this organization and kind of putting an effort, he has four or five crops a year instead of just one. And that has huge dividends throughout the region in terms of selling it, in terms of feeding people, uh, and he's been able to go around the world telling people about Zatar, kind of like me. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to talk about history. And I apologize in advance, there's a lot of time puns. So <laughs> this is, uh, bear with me. Uh, so the hair series is off. It's one of the oldest spices in the world. It's, it grows pervasively wildly in the Middle East. Uh, it's been eaten for centuries, all the way back to the 12th century. It has origins in Levantine culture. A lot of biblical roots, which we'll get into in a second. History of secrecy. Uh, and a lot of that's household to household. No one wanted to share their recipes. And then even the ancient Egyptians used thyme as an ingredient in the mummification process. Uh, so here's some... How would they use it? So they use it in the bandaging, in the wrapping. Uh, and so the biblical references is Zathar. One example is in Exodus. Uh, they use Zathar to kind of dip the blood of the, sh the lamb and put it over the doorsteps. 
Uh, and you see the quote here from Exodus. King David also used it uh, to represent cleanliness. So purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. And in case everyone, anyone forgot, hyssop is kind of the original word for zatar. And then Moses also used it to prepare the ashes of the red heifer, which is a cow, uh, used to kind of cook and clean it. And then the next one, zatar, also in the, still in the Bible, handling bodily contaminations. Uh, and so the, these other verses also in Leviticus refer to it being used to prepare birds and clean it and make sure everything is pure. And then so connected to that, I think, is, is where Zathar started to get this reputation as medicine. As it was used to purify and cleanse the body, people, I think, started using it uh, to treat people. And this starts with Maimonides, a famous Spanish Jewish philosopher. Uh, uh, so he started pr to prescribe it to his patients, and I think he was the first one to make Zathar popular as medicine. Uh, so he'd be great for the big pharma industry today. Uh, another one, Al-Kindi, the famous philosopher as well. He used time to treat bacterial infection and rash called St. Anthony's Fire, which sounds very painful. Uh, and then also the Islamic physician Al-Razi. He used time as an appetite enhancer, stomach purifier, and treatment for flatulence, which is contrary to what we just saw in the video. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you can use it for different things. Yeah. Uh, so here's some actual health benefits of Zatha. It has, because of time and oregano, it has a great source of vitamin A, C, E, K, calcium, iron, manganese, potassium, zinc, copper, folate, and dietary fiber. That's from the thyme oregano. Sumat, which is the dried berry, is full of flavonoids, vitamin C, which is obviously is great this time of year. And if you haven't gotten your flu shot, get it now. Uh, <laughs> sesame seeds are also considered one of the healthiest foods. They are rich in many nutrients, minerals, antioxidants, vitamins. Uh, they even have a high source of protein and omega-6 fatty acids. Uh, so other health benefits of zathar, as I'm sure many of you have heard over your life, uh, high in antioxidants, stimulates antimicrobial activity, which is good for that good gut health that everyone's talking about these days. Uh, it's also an anti-inflammatory, antiseptic, antispasmodic, expectorant, which gets the mucus out, worm expeller, and uh, enhances mood. There's really nothing Zatha can't do. Uh, and some other things that it's used as remedy for, uh, prevents digestive and allergic reactions to bread. So if you're gluten-free, I think the problem is you just haven't been putting Zatha on your bread. <laughs> so, uh, so it also solves st stomach problems. Whooping cough, sore throat, cold, flu, fevers, coughs, and bronchitis. It sounds like a commercial. <laughs> Menstrual cramps, internal parasites, indigestion, tooth pain, depression. Danny, yes. Is there like, I mean, as like a researcher, too, is there like an evidence base to this? Or there will be some, yes. <laughs> there will be some. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm in their pocket. Oh, I, I haven't looked into that yet, but you can try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I even read that it's good for bad breath, so some of you I would save that cup I gave you for after. <laughs> uh, so this is, thank you for that question. These things have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> However, uh, so, then, so then there's a little nutritional hype around it, and a lot of it that I just covered, uh, full of flavonoids, organic compounds that kind of have these great sources of antioxidants. And then, of course, the Middle East, Zatha has been always linked to improved cognitive performance. Uh, and this is result because of mood and memory-enhancing properties. And as many of you probably experience, it's eaten before exams. Uh, I know I did pretty good in school, and I ate a lot of Zatha. So. <laughs> uh, but, but some people think this is a myth that was started during the Civil War in Lebanon because rations were low and Zatha was abundant. So they told everyone it was good for the kids to eat before school so they wouldn't ask for anything else. So the other food rations were low at the time, but there was a lot of zatar growing. So I think they tricked the kids. If you eat it, you'll do good in school. Yeah. And now it's stuck. Uh, and so zatar has a brain frame. We'll explore that. And you see Einstein was onto it a long time ago. Uh, I know E equals MC squared was big, but this was more important, I thought. So, uh, yes, yeah. I took it myself, actually. <laughs> Yeah, Einstein was known to eat large quantities of zatar before he most of us went. Can we quote you on that? No, no. <laughs> but you can quote Einstein. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was a quote by one of the owners of the largest spice shops in Jordan. He says that, you know, zatar is, is so much of who we are, and all of our mothers used to make us eat zatar sandwiches before exams because everyone believes zatar makes you smarter. And that's where my original question so there is some science evidence here. Uh, so this is from a scientific journal called Molecules. And then there's these two, this thymol and, and carvacrol, which are present in the essential oils of both thyme and oregano. 
And so they did some studies with different dosages uh, on rats, not humans. It was very humane. Uh, but brain active, so they, they, they checked the neuronal activity, and they saw that you know, it might determine feelings of well-being, could possibly have different positive reinforcer effects. So improved happiness, which is always good, and has other you know, spillover effects. Uh, another uh, issue in the uh, British Journal of Nutrition, they did a similar study uh, using extracts of oregano, and also found it to be brain active, uh, which has moderate triple reuptake inhibitory activity, which I'm sure everyone knows what that means. Uh, if you ate more zaptan, you might. Uh, and it limits <laughs> positive behavioral effects in animals. So basically, in summation, they thought that it may be effective in enhancing mental well-being in humans. Uh, further research, of course, is needed, which is why I'm here today. Uh, and so I have an experiment that you are all unwilling participants in. <laughs> So the first, so here it is. My hypothesis is that if you eat zatha, then you will be smarter. And of course, so the independent variable will be zatha consumption, and then the dependent variable will be intelligence. <laughs> good. It's like, oh, you heard fine. No, it's good. Okay. So the first control is question number one. I'm gonna tell, see if anyone can solve this question. And uh, of course, no one knows because you haven't eaten your zatha yet. So this is probably you guys right now. You have no idea. What's going on. <laughs> Trying to the wheels turning, no other idea. Okay. And so now, now for the experiment, I'll ask everyone to take the cup of zat that I gave you earlier and take a little. And if you had, if you pour yourself too much, be careful. Don't toss it all back at once. Just a little bit. So take your shot of zatha. Take two if you want. <laughs> everyone good? And toss it back. Yeah. <laughs> Someone get her some olive oil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I used to not, but I do now, actually. So to... Yeah, so this is a Palestinian blend. Yeah, so what you're all tasting is a Palestinian blend of Zalta. Uh, yeah, you can have that. There's a backup over there. Okay, and so now that you've taken your Zatha, the second part of the experiment, there's a question. Jeff, so Jeff had six jars of Zatha. No one likes to share the Zatha, but Jeff was feeling particularly generous on this day, so he gave two jars to Mary. How many jars of Zatha does Jeff have left? Now that you've taken your Zatha, this is you guys. All right, figuring out? Yeah, that's right. Here you go. Uh, and so the conclusion that I'm sure everyone would agree with, Zatha makes you smarter. And then so now I want to... <laughs> Take a little more. Take a little more. <laughs> I don't think you had enough. Uh, and then, so now I want to look at you know zatha. You know, it is a food so steeped in history. And I want to look at how it's evolved and how it's present today. And um, for people who are kind of aware of zatha and food, it's become increasingly present in recipes, in restaurant menus. You see it everywhere now. And with such a focus on health foods and foods with a story and sourcing and sustainability. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Zatha pop up more and more places. Uh, it's definitely something great, as you can see, to include in your diet. Uh, and my time is up. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I have my sources. Uh, okay, there you go. You take any questions, yes. You know, I explicitly told her not to, and that's why she did. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I should have been checking. I should have checked. I remember you said, you talked about breakfast. She said, did you eat Zatha before or after the cereal? <laughs> she kept going, huh? <laughs> yeah. That was two more days. She said, you are an awesome guy. This is your mom under your Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is she, is she done? Or is she <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Denny? For him or his mom? Yeah. yeah either, either, either. <laughs> um, so, I don't know enough about, like, Zafa per se, obviously, because it's too desperate to eat stuff, but mm. I met someone on a plane once who um, was just leaving Italy. She was studying, like, a Mediterranean diet, and she was yeah. a gerontologist, so, like, studying, like, apparently along the Mediterranean and parts of Italy are, like, the oldest, the people who live longer than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Like that, well, two components that led to like a very healthy long term diet. But 
you probably know way more than me about this. <laughs> at least that component. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Quick comment on that. Yes. Yeah. Because I was also upset with that question because my mom was like, you know, every day. Uh, it turns out sesame, <laughs> sesame seed gives you that the food to the brain, like the blood flow faster, which oh. presumably makes you smart. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't know. It didn't work on me. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did anyone else's parents say it opens your brain? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Memory yeah. retention. Yeah. But like, so you eat it while you study, then you eat it after, before the test. Yeah. And after the test, just. <laughs> yeah. Who makes the best doctor? Who? I think that's I think that's for another presentation. I assume that question was for his mother. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? So actually, it does, it, so it, it, yeah, it, it's primarily in subtropical areas and pretty specific or best grown in areas near the Middle East. But it, I mean, it has spread a little bit. So like, you know, it's eaten in Turkey and other countries kind of on the periphery of the Middle East. But I think we will see it spreading. And now that people can grow in different climates and it's like kind of purposeful planting. I meant something more specific. Like, I mean, I think just four Arab countries really. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't think it's a Middle Yeah. So and then I, so I even saw, so like, um, so different countries eat it, but they don't make the same mix. So even like Morocco, they don't really eat zaata, right? Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know the 100% the true answer to that, but I'm guessing it's because of where it was grown and then people kind of, you know, used to, yeah. I did find it interesting. I was in Greece, and I was like, and they have all these this wild oregano. That's true. How, how good her yeah, they're the best. <laughs> She's right about that. I'll keep you <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Yeah. I'll just make a really quick comment. So I'm Egyptian, and it's funny because we don't actually have uh, zlatan in Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's become like a staple that they have it in households, but we import it. Yeah. From like Lebanon, Palestine, etc. Mm -hmm. So I, all, all my good friends are like a popcorn fiend, and my one of my favorite recipes. Actually, pop the popcorn on the with stove Zata, yeah. olive oil, mm -hmm. and then season it with zaza, and you will make your friends like yeah. For drinks. <laughs> so it's crazy now that sprinkle it over the top when it's done. People think it's trendy because when I was younger, my parents would make me like that's like yeah. And all the other kids would be like, that's gross. What is that? Yeah. Like, why do you have like weird sprinkles? Yeah. And now they're like on Instagram. Yeah, we had uh, people used to ask me why I was eating an ant sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> It's now people are eating ants, even, so, you know, I was just ahead of my time. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Johnny? Oh. <laughs> when we were growing up, were you the one that would always eat my manusha in the morning? Yes. <laughs> my, brother, by the way. my brother, Johnny, in addition to my mom on the comments. <laughs> What oh, scandal? <laughs> oh, this is good. <laughs> yeah, a lot of filler. So a lot of people use different things for filler. Wheat even is a big, big culprit. Uh, all I would say is if, if you're the kind of person who puts filler in your zapata. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like a lot of times. So the guy mentioned like the Syrian zapata has like the adami and the chickpeas and all that. In my mind, I don't. I consider that as like rounding out of flavors as yeah. opposed to filler. But yeah, I heard, have heard like wood chips and weed and mm -hmm. all this stuff. Yeah, no, those, those other ingredients are adding to the flavor, right? But a lot of people, if you get like a really light zata that's fluffy in consistency, you know, it's, it's just right. filler or something, yeah. What happened when the Israelis did their like time plan? Yes. They yeah, I was like, they really did it like 
Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know exactly, but I imagine there was, there was a lot of protests. I know people are still upset about it and, you know, because it you know, represents so much more than just the food. You know, it's like the last strip. Yeah. <laughs> um, South Head isn't the only name. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of uh, concerns, and I think the bigger, the, the most prominent one is the population with more um, olive oil. Yeah. Yeah. In that picture, you had the Zatar on the cactus, mm -hmm. which the cactus, if I'm right, is another symbol of Palestinian like state and own land. So I, um, we'll, we learned this in, in class. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but he's an artist, and he does, like, cactus paintings. Oh, and I didn't know that, actually. It's, it's a symbol of his homeland, because the Jewish did the tree planting mm -hmm. projects and everything, yeah. and they wiped out the Palestinian residences, and there was no trace of them, but those cacti had such deep roots and, and so in the soil that you can still see the outlines of old homesteads of yeah. Palestinians with the cactus. Yeah. So that became a symbol that he uses. He, he put the little cactus on the flower pot on his, on, his, on his window, and that's like, you know, he always has that. It's been uprooted, and it's, it's not, doesn't have a home, but it's still with them. And oh, that's great. So seeing that, I was like, that, that was on purpose. No yeah. No question about it. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I didn't know that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.